I wanted to talk about the Black Panther Party because uh, they just had the 50th anniversary of uh, the Black Panther Party's free breakfast for kids program. Uh, and um, I, I did a lot of research about uh, the Black Panther Party a couple, maybe a year ago. And it's always been something that's been of interest to me. Um, so one of the things the Black Panther Party did was start these programs where they offered free breakfast for kids um, before school so that they could have a, you know, a healthy start to their day. Uh, and this year, it was the 50th anniversary of it, back in October. Um, it was organized by the People's Collective Kitchen, or People, yeah, People's Kitchen Collective. People's Kitchen Collective, PKC, um, and Frederica Newton, who's the wife of Huey P. Newton, who's one of the uh, founders of the Black Panther Party. Uh, there's a lot of misconceptions about the Black Panthers. There's a ton of misconceptions about the Black Panthers, right? Uh, I think the initial thing is that they're this militant black revolutionary group, and they are. They kind of started that way. Um, they, they were like, who's going to police the police? Because these police are beating up black people in their own neighborhoods. So one of the things they would do is they would, uh, you know, these guys were registered gun owners. They would get their guns, and there was, a, 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 I think, a law in California that had said that they could stand at a specific distance to observe what the police was doing to make sure the police was doing their job properly. So that's what they did. They went out with their pistols and their rifles, and they stood at a specific distance away from the cops, the legal distance, and they watched how the, uh, the cop was treating a specific black person. Uh, and that pissed off the police officers, obviously. So they wanted to, you know, uh, say that these guys are, are, are brandishing weapons against the police and so on and so forth. So the Black Panther Party decided to organize to prove that they have the, you know, black people have the right to bear arms. They are part of the, con they, you know, they, they, they have the right to the Second Amendment. Uh, so they went down to do a peaceful protest with their guns. And unfortunately, Ronald Reagan was talking to like the young Republicans or some shit. And, you know, he was the governor of California at the time and basically got panicked because here comes a bunch of uh, armed black men walking up to the uh, uh, to, 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 to the capital in California. And I understand how that could be misconstrued. Uh, so there was all this negative campaigning. And even in the media, when you listen to the interview, like they basically address exactly what they're doing. This was a protest to, to show that black people have the right to bear arms. They have the right to the Second Amendment. Um, you know, they are citizens of this country. And the misconception with that is that they're violent, militant, uh, they're a militant organization. Um, they, you know, they, uh, sometimes people have even equated them to black nationalists and they're not. They, really what they are is that they're a political party. I think. If, if uh, you know, I, I'm wrong about that, uh, please feel free to correct me, uh, leave a comment to, uh, to correct my misconcep misconception of the Black Panther Party being a political party. Um, you know, because I think the true the true history of the Black Panthers involves social programs and community engagement. They did things to better low income communities, right? That they that they saw were having a hard time, and they basically took it upon themselves to say, "We want to better our own community. We want to better the lives of people that are living here." The government doesn't seem to be doing that. The cops don't seem to be doing that. Our politicians don't seem to be doing that. So they started it. Right, so in 1969, the Free for Children Breakfast Program uh, was started at St. Augustine Episcopal Church. Look at that. A fucking church doing something good for the community, as it should be. Your role is to offer spirituality, faith, and comfort uh, and, and be that for part of a community, and that's what they did. They partnered with the church. Uh, and I remember reading about this uh, a year ago. This is from a Guardian article. And uh, I remember reading about this years ago. Um, and it was like everybody was getting involved. It wasn't just black people. Black people, white people, everybody that lived in that neighborhood had to coexist with each other. And, and no, children, no child should go hungry, right? Like this wasn't specifically just for black children. It was for all children. Latino kids, Indian kids, black kids, white kids, whatever, what, whoever, you're, if you're a kid and you're going to school, the Black Panther Party believed that you shouldn't be going to school uh, on an empty stomach. Because if you go to school on an empty stomach, it's going to affect 
the way you learn, it's going to affect the way that you uh, go about for the rest of your life. You're, you, you know, it's going to affect your mental health, your physical health. So they fed kids, and a bunch of people from the community got together and they donated stuff. They did this with medicine too. From the Guardian article, Bill X. Jennings, who's an, uh, who's, who became a Panther archivist, uh, said that when the program was initiated, they sent two members um, from uh, from these different chapters to learn to learn how to start something like this uh, in their own community. It was important for the Black Panthers to not just have this community movement, but to also teach people to teach people how to start this in their own communities. That's what community engagement is all about. Once you, you know, once you learn something and, and, and you see it being beneficial and you want that to spread and you want that to grow, then you teach people how to do it. I, information is not to be held secretively. I, I've, I've always found that very bizarre when people you know, learn some shit and they're like, oh, this is mine, mine to hold. Information is not the one ring to rule them all. It is something that can help you, you know, have a little bit more power. Knowledge is power. But it's not something to be lorded over people. I think information and knowledge is to be shared with people. It is, it is something that uh, is beneficial to everybody. And that's what they were doing. And this was a threat because the program was very successful, right? The, the free kids... Uh, Free breakfast for kids. I mean, this was a very successful program. A lot of people got involved in it. Everybody felt good about what they were doing. Uh, Everybody felt good about participating in the community, making sure that everybody is taken care of. That's what most people want. They want their community to be strong and the people that live in that community uh, to to be living their best lives. And this was uh, helping people do that in a lot of different ways. I think when you're in, in service to your community, in service to something, um, in any way, shape, or form, it, you know, it makes you feel good. It puts you in a better mental state, um, and uh, and and that positivity kind of uh, exudes from you. It, it kind of spreads around. And th- and this was a threat. J. Edgar Hoover, J. Edgar Hoover, found this to be a threat. Uh, and I'm going to kind of paraphrase the quote a little bit here, uh, but he said the program represents the best and the most influential activity. So basically, what he's saying is that it's so popular that it's starting to influence people. It's starting to spread because they taught people how to do it. They saw the program was working. Everybody was on board. They fucking loved it. They loved the Black Panther. They were being a positive influence for the community, right? So uh, he said, this is one of our greatest threats. The positive influence is a great is the one of the greatest threats, according to J. Edgar Hoover of the FBI, director of the FBI. Uh, and he goes on to say, uh, that they need to neutralize BPP and destroy what it stands for. The Black Panther Party stood for community engagement, stood for social programs, they stood for taking care of each other, stood for equality and justice for everybody. And J. Edgar Hoover said it was a threat because it was a positive influence and they need to neutralize this and they need to destroy what it stands for. And that's what they did. They they ran a smear campaign, and they and they uh, uh, you know uh, demolished the the actual true history of the Black Panther Party. Fortunately, now um, you, you know uh, we see what the Black Panther Party actually is. Uh, there's a lot of people that are talking about. It. There's like a bunch of TED talks about uh, the real history of the Black Panther Party that I've watched, and they're fantastic. They're very informative. It opens your eyes to really seeing what uh, the power that comes from communities taking care of each other, communities working with each other. Incredible, incredible stuff. And then what happens? 1975, the government creates a free breakfast program in schools. Because the Black Panther Party was doing it on a community level, not on a governmental level. It was spreading around. It was working. People enjoyed it. People liked it. And the government was like, well, we better fucking cash in on that, make it a social program. Good. That's what it should be. 
Community programs like this should be used as an example, proof of concept. And what should have happened was the, the Black Panther Party should have been directly involved with the government in making sure that this program doesn't run amok, making sure that this program doesn't get corrupted, making sure that you know there, there is somebody that's going to legitimately fight for it uh, when people want to cut programs like this, because they do want to cut programs like this. But they won't cut the military. Nah. Let's not defund the fucking war machine. We'll defund the breakfast program for kids first. We'll defund arts. To, you know, we'll defund anything that helps uh, kids think critically. We'll get rid of that shit. And then we'll use education uh, as, a, as a way to uh, make good workers and uh, uh, push our propaganda down. Like the tunnel made it a little bit of an ominous situation as I said that. <laughs> the Black Panthers are an example of, of how community programs can spark big movements. It's proof of that. We, did, we saw it. They are teaching people how to make free breakfast. They were, they were you know, socializing medicine to take care of people in their communities. What we see on a consistent basis, all of these stories together is that when you put compassion and, and people first, these movements work. They succeed. It can't be a profit motive. It has to be taking care of each other. That should be your primary motive. Your primary motive is how can I help everybody, not just pe- members of my own political party, not just members uh, uh, of my own uh, sexual orientation, not just members of my own skin color. No, everybody. When you treat them with compassion and understanding and you educate them and you put and you put the people first over profit, you think the fucking Black Panthers were making money off of this free breakfast program? No. They were getting donations from shopkeepers, restaurants. We the people are the example of how governments and society should work. What we see on these small community level, that's how these governments should be working. We should be making our laws and running our economies on on compassion and understanding. Not profit motives, not bottom lines. That shit doesn't help anybody except corporations. It only helps a few people. The reason why the Black Panthers are gaining more popularity and, and people are seeing the true history behind them, seeing what they actually are and using them as an example to take care of their communities is because they put compassion first. Why you're seeing socialists like uh, Kashama Savant and Brandon Betts win in cities like Lansing and Seattle. Why you see candidates like Tulsi Gabbard on the rise for, for, for the uh, presidential nomination. Why, why you see, uh, you know, uh, representatives and congressional members that get elected that are on the fringes of things is because they talk about taking care of people. They put people first. They are in service to the people. And look, I don't agree with, you know, everything that, uh, that these people say all the time Um, And that's okay because part of the thing is you're allowed to have differences and communicate those differences through discourse, through understanding and compassion. Not through yelling and screaming and uh, playing the blame game all the time. Hey, thanks for watching this video. Uh, This is part of a little series I do called Road Reflections, where I talk to you while I'm on tour uh, about the current sociopolitical environment, current news stories, uh, debates, that sort of stuff that I don't get to talk about on my podcast, Taboo Table Talk or Forkful of Noodles. It's a little bit looser. And uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this clip. If you guys enjoyed it, uh, you can find the full episodes on my Facebook page. Uh, You can go like Krish Mohan, uh, social vigilante and comedian. 
and uh, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, uh, share this out if you enjoyed it. Um, and another way to help uh, see more regular content is by becoming a patron over at patreon.com slash kushmohanhaha. Thanks again, guys, and we'll see you on the road. If you enjoyed the content of this video, there is a very good chance that you probably will enjoy my live stand-up comedy. I'm going to be touring all across the country, so if you are in Atlanta, Charlotte, North Carolina, Wilmington, North Carolina, Augusta, Georgia, Fort Wayne, Indiana, Champaign, Illinois, Bloomington, Illinois, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Madison, Wisconsin, Minneapolis, Minnesota, I will be coming to your city very soon. You can go get your tickets to come see my live stand-up comedy over at ramennoodlescomedy.com. That's R-A-M-A-N noodlescomedy.com. I hope to see you guys there. Thanks for checking out the video, and we'll see you on the road.